I would now like to introduce to you Peter Sweeney, thinking globally and acting locally. Thanks, Joy. Are we going to hug both? Yeah, we're going to hug both. Well, both times. All right. That's right. Hi, everybody. Hey, Tricia. The first thing that I remember, and the thing that I remember the most, is the smell. It's the smell of a teeming mass of humanity. It's a smell of fear. It's a smell of uncertainty. It's a smell of bodily functions. I'm talking about perhaps the busiest maternity ward on the planet. 30,000 babies are delivered in this hospital every year. 30,000. To give you some perspective, Grand River Hospital up the street is the busiest birthing unit in Canada, maybe just over 4,000. 30,000 souls come into this world in this one hospital. It's called Malago Hospital, and it's in Kampala, which is the capital of Uganda. And when I walked into the maternity ward, it's about half the, room, half the size of this room. And if each and every one of you in this room today represented one woman in the last throes of giving birth, you would all be crammed into this room half the size. A few of you would be lucky enough to have a bed, the paper-thin mattress, but most of you would be on the floor. Because of space limitations, you would be alone, and yet you'd be surrounded. The smell is of disease, of desperation, but sometimes of life and of hope. Some of you representing those women lying on that floor right now won't make it through the night. In Uganda, the maternal mortality rate is 550, 550 per 100,000. Canada, five. What does this have to do with a conference on social networking and the real-time web? Nothing. And everything. So you walk down the hall and you go into the neonatal unit, and in a room where in Canada you'd probably have seven or eight babies, preemies, and incubators, I counted them one after another, after another, after another, after another. 32 babies in that room. The obstetrician who was beside me gave me a wry smile and he said, Peter, it's better than last time I was here. They were two to a crib. And in behind these cribs was another room and inside 27 incubators. Every single one of them broken, dusty, empty. Because if you send an incubator somewhere after six months, if the filter runs down, which it will, if you don't have one to replace it with, it's useless. If you don't have an engineer who can fix it when it breaks down, it's garbage. And those 27 incubators for me were the perfect example of what happens when the world dumps its good intentions on the developing world. Again, what does this have to do with social media? Nothing and everything. Because I think we spend too much time worrying about feeling good rather than doing good. And I think social media can, and Twitter and blogging and all that can be part of that problem and part of that solution. For me, I'm a newbie in this. I couldn't do the work that I do overseas without Twitter. I found that out very quickly in Gulu in northern Uganda. You're 10 kilometers from the Sudanese border. You're in a former war zone. I didn't have hot water for five days. The electricity was off for 14 hours a day. To say that the internet is sketchy would be putting it mildly. Wi-Fi is non-existent, but my Blackberry worked better there than it does in my own backyard <laughs> in, in Waterloo. And what struck me when I, got, when I was there, I would realize if I would blog, because my, my preference is to blog, because I like to tell stories. But what I, what I noticed is when I would finally get a blog posted and then I would send it out on Twitter, imagine that, the page views went through the roof, and you know what? So do people donating to our cause. But more importantly, and I think most effectively for me, 
And this might, will not come as a surprise to most of you who do this way more often and way more effectively than I do. When I got home, people didn't say to me, hey, how was your trip? What they said was, thanks for taking me along. I think the other challenge we have with our social media and with this revolution of technology, the term the global, the global village was coined years ago. And the web and all the tools that it has and enables should make the world smaller and smaller and more connected and more connected and more connected. But yet, and it's been said in the last few postings here, the last few presentations, the risk is that we become less connected. And I think where we have to remember is that everything that happens in the developing world, all of our financial and political actions, have a direct impact on people around the world. I spent some of my time in Haiti, and when I land there, if you've ever been there, and if you ever go there, certainly now, and you land in Haiti, and you go through Port-au-Prince, and you see buildings that look like the earthquake just happened minutes ago. You see a city that is ravaged by poverty, ravaged by hopelessness. You see 600,000 people who are still living in tents. It's 20 months later. And you could be forgiven if you landed and you said, I have come to another planet. It is that different. And yet, it's 300 miles from Miami. And the parents that I met have kids just like me. I met a young mom. All she wanted her six-year-old boy to do was read. That's all I want my six-year-old boy to learn how to do is read. They want income. They want happiness. They want stability. We should be more connected to the people. It's not those people over there. And I think these tools can allow us to do that. But we have to remember in our interactions that there's humanity at the other end. Rami mentioned that. I think the most poignant example for me was going through the streets of Port-au-Prince the night before was a terrible monsoon. And you can imagine 600,000 people scrambling into their tents. I'd never seen rain like it in my life. And you wake up the next morning and you're going through the city and it's a beautiful blue sky. It's 45 degrees and people are coming out of these tent cities and they're walking through the streets of rubble and garbage and sewage and human excrement, and dogs running and crapping all over the place. And they're walking to work and somehow they come out of these tents and they bring their kids. And I remember this mother and she came out and this little girl had this perfectly pressed white blouse on, a perfect kilt, and her hair in ribbons and bobs. I have two little girls, I can't put a barrette in. And this would have taken hours in my mind. And picture that scene, and she's walking through that devastation on her way to school, to take her daughter to school. And she stops at a corner vendor, and the little girl puts her foot up on a box, and the mother reaches into her purse, and in my mind's eye, she's handing over her last pennies. And the man reaches down, and he shines her daughter's shoes. Because when you don't have the material things, you keep the one thing that nobody can take away from you, your pride and your dignity. So no matter what you do and how you do it, do things that matter, do things that do good, and remember there's a human being on the other side. Thank you.